people who are young do not understand in any real way, even if they know the fact, homosexuality was against the law. It was against the law, not just your parents didn't like you, you know, or your, you know, people you went to school with didn't like you. It was actually a crime. There was a special squad of police who used to hang out in public washrooms looking for gay behavior and then arresting people who exhibited it. And those names and numbers would go in the paper. We were warned about who, who to speak to. Uh, if the guys were too good looking, they were possibly cops who were in there um, to pick you up and then beat you up, take them down to uh, one of the beaches and basically leave them there beat up, which was kind of a, you know, a regular weekend happening. If you were found out, I mean, a lot of people kind of, people kind of knew if you played the game right, you'd be okay. But if you affirmed or asserted yourself or pushed in any way, shape or form, lose your job like that. You lose your job anyway without doing that. There were no civil liberties protections of any kind. Stonewall was like a thunderclap. The fact the gays had fought back was astonishing to me. There was a generation of young gay people who were more militarized. They weren't content with, oh, well, you really shouldn't be raiding uh, gay bars, you shouldn't be arresting drag queens. When it yet again got raided by the police, the patrons decided enough is enough. We're not going to put up with this anymore. And there was what's referred to as the Stonewall Riots. And that, for most certainly gay men, um, marks the beginning of the gay liberation movement. Gay rights now! Gay rights now! Gay rights now! Gay Tenduga epitomized a politic of a deep pleasure in the community we built up out of Stonewall against the odds, against the Anita Bryants, against the rise of the Reagan right. I love homosexuals, if you can believe that. I love them enough to tell them the truth because I know that there is hope for the homosexuals that if they're willing to uh, turn from uh, sin the same as any individual, that, uh, that they can be ex-homosexuals the same as there can be an ex-murderer, an ex-thief, or ex-anybody. We had a crew lounge where we had to check in all the time. And they were, everybody was talking about gay town, how beautiful it was, and so on. So I was obviously curious to see. And one day I was in the comm center, and I saw him, big smile, and we clicked right away. We, we were friends instantly. I appreciated working with Gaetan because I didn't have to follow him around. I didn't have to say, well, you know, this is how we're supposed to do it. Why are you taking shortcuts? Working for an airline was really a good home for, for gay, gay guys, gay people, lesbian, um, because they were extremely, extremely good workers. Of course, the airline, they were not blind to all this. They hired a lot of gay people. In fact, I would say at the time, it must have been at least 75%, 80% of the guys were gay. Word was out, at least among the gay people, and probably even more around the straight people, that here was this, uh, you know, uh, outrageous gay guy, um, you know, who, um, well, outrageous gay guy. Oh, yes, that was Gaetan's attitude, yeah, like, you know, he doesn't have a problem about being gay. You do, so deal with it. He even had his shirt adjusted tight, 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 which was not the, the airline rule, but he, you know, he, and his pants were so tight, you could see everything, basically. I would say he was more than fairly and he was incredibly flamboyant. He loved eyeshadows, a little bit of blue or purple, and he um, also had the uh, mascara. How do you describe charisma, you know? But yes, he walked down the hall and you could see him stand out, you know? But he was very kind of, uh, you know, he flowed. But a great personality, you could tell right away, very smiling and joking right away. 
both of us, we used to color our hair the same color, and we'd do it on his couch watching The Young and the Restless. I did get a white Corvette. Well, he said, oh, we must go for a ride, we must go for a ride, so we did. And you you think that Gaetan would sit down in the passenger seat and that's it? No, he was sitting in the back the moment we got to Young Street, waving at the people. And I said, I don't care, you know. Everybody was laughing in a way or waving. Actually, I've got copies of those pictures right here. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. One so you, you see what? Ah, uh, in, in my in the white Corvette. <laughs> my best friend that died from AIDS, Lady Shaw McDonald. Yeah. He's right there. He was with Gaetan at the time. Hairdresser in New Yorkville. The sweetest man, French Canadian again. That was a good time because there was, was AIDS around at the time. I don't know, but there was no worry. We were having fun. <laughs> The 70s were just fabulous. Um, you know, now it was all, there was all this sex, and there was all, this, all these drugs going around, and we didn't yet know that drugs were really not a good idea. You know, it is true that you could not believe what New York was like back then. You know, people would be, I would be like walking out with a friend of mine, a, a man who's gay, and it, I would be talking to him, and then he would be gone. You know, and he would be like, he saw someone in the street, they looked at each other, they left. All through the 70s, sex was kind of the gay man's obligation. You had to prove that you were a gay man by having as much sex as possible because this was gay liberation. And so I remember being introduced to Gaetan. We didn't really click. And I, I can tell you why is because Gaetan was a much more sexually adventurous person than I ever was. He was really... I think the first gay man that went out and said, this is my lifestyle. And I remember saying to the straight guy who I didn't know, are you telling me that if there was a street in New York filled with beautiful 20-year-old girls who you could just look at and take into a doorway or something that you wouldn't do it? You would do it. You just can't do it because women won't do it. I mean, a small price to pay for owning the world, I would say. Being in a queer club or just a disco club early on once you make it you know in the door past the doorman there's liberation on the dance floor what it was was anonymous you did not know the name of the person which meant you did not know whether this person was a truck driver you know or vice president of chase bank because we thought that sex was good for you like hell. Like New York was an orgy. I don't even know how to describe it. And to, uh, and to me, it seemed like you couldn't possibly have sex with too many different people. What could be healthier? What could be more delightful? Feminists were celebrating and reclaiming clitoral orgasm as, as central to women's sexuality. It was as if gay men were busy discovering that the other half of their dick was inside their rectum. It was a golden age, wow. Well. Oh, it was. Yeah, golden age. How was it like, well, in the 70s? Kind of fun, kind of great, <laughs> um, you know. The bathhouses were meeting places. That's where you met people. You went dancing, and then you went to the bathhouse, you know. You're probably aware that the Continental Bath had Beth Midler. No one had to say, oh, this is Rock Hudson call. We would walk him around to the booths and shove him in a booth, and you could hear someone go, oh, my God, it's Rock Hudson. <laughs> Elton John is right there, and he's dancing right beside it. Calvin Klein recently in the New York Times made a comment saying that the three great decades of the 20th century were Berlin in the 20s, Paris in the 30s, and New York City in the 70s. And I, I agree with her. They had discotheques, and yes, gay discotheques everywhere. London, New York, San Francisco. All these places that we flew to. And I got very clearly, I think, that uh, Gaetan liked having encounters that were no responsibility. Sliding his business card, or, the, or they were coming from passengers. 
Gaetan had said, did you notice the, the guy in such and such a seat? Cute. I bet you I can make more time with him than you can, uh, which often was true. This guy is definitely straight. There's no way Gaetan. Well, you know, he's going to do anything with him, but the passenger goes. It was more important to have a party for him, obviously. But it was such a revelation uh, to discover that, that anal sex could be pleasurable and clean. I mean, it was kind of an acquired taste. You didn't just, usually you didn't jump into it. There was a whole subculture that went with learning how to bottom learning how to relax, learning how to douche, learning how to open up. You know, it wasn't just about sex. It was about men loving men. It was about seeing other gay men as your brother and caring about them and making love to them and being tender with them and affectionate with them and having relationships with them. Gaytan actually told me that. He had a project of having sex with a different man every night. It was uh, just kind of an entertainment. Like, it, it was a project he worked on with great uh, intensity and effort and success. Well, you know, if you scored, say, two nights a week, and you did that for a year, that's 100 people. So from 71 to 81, that's 1,000 people. Your average gay man probably had sex with 1,000 people in that decade. And I'm sure Guitard Dugas had sex with many more than 1,000 people. Oh, yes. He was an extremely sexual man. He was always ready. Always ready, okay? He never knew. I was going to work, and he had his backpack. And uh, there was a something in the backpack, and it fell. So I said, oh, what's that? Mon <gasps> lubricant. I can't go anywhere without that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so he picked it up right away and put it in his pocket. Like, was he sexual? I would say so. Sex, drugs, disco. Uh, a sex. But as the 70s wore on and the commercialization of gay male sex exploded, you no longer had to care about the movement. You could just come in, get your rocks off and go. And it didn't really force you to um, think politically about um, this being an opportunity for America to move forward in terms of its empathy and understanding and bridging all these divides that the culture creates to keep us apart instead of united. You know, it's very easy to fall into the hedonistic side because it's intoxicating, but there was a price to pay, I think, for that. You could see from the lifestyle of New York that candles were being burned at both ends. Yeah, it's great fun. But if it was a lifestyle, uh, it was going to burn out. Young men, full of testosterone and opportunity. Something was likely to happen. A friend of mine called from the other side of San Francisco, but he was straight, and he said, Hey, have you heard about the new gay cancer? Ha <laughs> ha, there's a gay cancer out there. Uh, that, no, that's crazy. Being gay has nothing to do with cancer. Um, and then it just got awful. It got worse and worse and worse from that moment on. I wish I'd never heard the term gay cancer. This is very early 81. There's something going on. Uh, there's some people in the New York City emergency rooms with gay men and you know who were seriously ill and uh within a week or so there were a couple of deaths reported i had referred a man with a rash gay man with a peculiar sort of rash to my consultant dermatologist and he phoned me back to postulate to me isn't it a little strange the all these very strange rashes that we started seeing in gay men. I remember the first person I know who had AIDS, but no one knew what he had. And he died. I was so shocked. You know, what did he die of? Because we were too young to be dying. Reading the newspaper that morning, there was the famous little paragraph, eight New Yorkers died of mysterious gay cancer, and word was filtering from Fire Island. The whispers had begun. There were a lot of 